Chapter 36 To Trap a Fox 1969 Joe walked through the opened door of the sheriff's office. Okay, got the report. Let's have a look. Both men scanned quickly to the last page. Ed said, That's it. A perfect match. Fibres from her hat were on Chase's jacket as he lay dead. The sheriff slapped the report across, across his wrist, then continued. Let's review what we have here. Number one, the shrimper will testify that he saw Miss Clark boating toward the fire tower just before Chase fell to his death. His colleague will back him up. Two, Paddy Love said Miss Clark made the shell necklace for Chase and it disappeared the night he died. And three, fibres from her hat were on his jacket. Four, motive. A woman wronged, and an alibi we can refute. That should do it. A better motive might help, Joe said. Being jilted doesn't seem like enough. It's not like we're finished with this, with the investigation, but we have enough to bring her in for questioning. Probably enough to charge her. We'll see how it goes once we get her here. Well, that's the problem, isn't it? How? She outrun everybody for years. Truant officers, census takers, you name it, she'll outwit them, including us. We all got out there chasing her through the swamp grass, we will make fools of ourselves. I'm not afraid of that. Just because nobody else could catch her doesn't mean we can't. But that wouldn't be the smartest way of doing it. I say we set a trap. Oh yeah, well, the deputy said, I know a thing or two about trapping. And when you got it, when you got a trap of fox, it's usually the trap that gets foxed. It's not like we have surprise on our side. We've been out there knocking on her door enough to scare off a brown bear. What about the hounds? That'd be a sure thing. The sheriff was silent for a few seconds. I don't know. Maybe I'm getting old and soft at the grand old age of 51. But running down a woman, a woman with hounds for questioning doesn't seem right. It's fine for escaped convicts. People already convicted of some crime. But like everybody else, she's innocent until proven guilty. I can't see setting hounds on a female suspect. Maybe as a last resort, but not yet. Okay, well, what kind of trap? That's what we've got to figure out. On December 15th, as Ed and Joe discussed options of how to bring Kaya in, someone knocked on the door. The large form of a man loomed behind the frosted glass. Come on in, the sheriff said. As the man stepped inside, Ed said, Well, hello, Rodney. What can we do for you? Rodney Horn, a retired mechanic, spent most of his days fishing with his pal, Denny Smith. The villagers knew him as quiet and settled, always in bib overalls. Never missed church, but wore his overalls there as well, with a nice fresh shirt, iron and starch stiff as a plank by his wife, Elsie. Rodney took off his felt hat and held it in front of his belly. Ed offered him a chair, but Rodney shook his head. This won't take long, he said. Just something a bit relevant about the Chase Andrews thing. What you got? Joe asked. Well, it was a while back now. Me and Denny were out fishing on August 30 this year, and we seen something out at Cypress Cove. Think it might be of interest to you. Go ahead. The sheriff said. But please sit down, Rodney. We'd all fall, feel a bit more comfortable if you sat. Rodney took the chair offered and for the next five minutes told them his story. After he left, Ed and Joe looked at each other. Joe said, Well, now we've got motive. Let's get her in here. Chapter 37 Grey Sharks 1969 just days before Christmas, and earlier in the morning than usual, Kaya motored slowly and quietly toward Jumpin's. Ever since the sheriff or his deputy had been sneaking out to her place, trying to catch her at home, failed efforts she observed from the palmettos, she'd bought her gas and supplies before first light, when only fishermen were about. Now, low clouds scudded just above the sloshing sea, and to the east a squall, twisted tightly like a whip, threatened from the horizon. She'd have, she'd have to finish at Jumpin's quickly and get home before it hit. 
From a quarter of a mile out, she saw his wharf billowed, in with, fo billowed with fog. She slowed even more and looked around for other boats in the soggy quiet. Finally, about forty yards out, she could see Jumpin's form in the old chair leaning against the wall. She waved. He did not. He did not stand. He shook his head slightly, just a whisper. She let go of the throttle. She waved again. Jumpin stared at her but did not move. Jerking the stick, she turned abruptly back toward the sea. But coming in from the fog was a large boat, the sheriff at the helm. Another couple of boats flanking, and just behind him, the squall. Gunning her engine, she threaded the needle between the oncoming rigs, her boat banging whitecaps as she raced for the open sea. She wanted to cut back toward the marsh, but the sheriff was too close. He'd catch her before she got there. The sea no longer swelled in symmetrical waves, but tossed in confusion. The water grew meaner as the edge of the storm engulfed her. In seconds it released a torrent. She was soaked through, long strands of her hair stringing across her face. She turned into the wind to keep from capsizing, but the sea pushed over the bow. Knowing their boats were faster, she hunched forward into the ragged wind. Maybe she could lose them in this soup, or dive into the sea and make a swim for it. Her mind raced through the details of jumping in, which seemed her best chance. This close to shore, there'd be a backwash or a rip, which would zip her along underwater just faster than they'd think that she could swim. Popping up to breathe now and then, she could get to land and sneak out on a brushy shore. Behind her, their motors raced louder than the storm, getting closer. How could she simply stop? She'd never given up. She'd had to jump now. But suddenly, like grey sharks, they amassed around her, pulling close. One of the boats whipped in front of her, and rammed its side, throwing back against the outboard, her neck jerked. The sheriff reached out and grabbed her gunwale, all, them, all of them wallowing in the churning wakes. Two men swung into her boat and the deputy said, Miss Catherine Clark, you're under arrest for the murder of Chase Andrews. You have the right to remain silent. She didn't hear the rest of it. No one hears the rest of it. Chapter 38 Sunday Justice, 1970 Kaya's eyes blinked shut against sharp light that poured from overhead lamps and windows as tall as the ceiling. For two months she lived in dimness, and now, opening her eyes again, caught a soft edge of the marsh outside. Rounded oaks sheltering shrub-sized ferns and winter holly she tried to hold the vital green a second longer, than, but was led by a firm hand toward a long table and chairs where her attorney, Tom Milton, sat. Her wrists were cuffed in front, forcing her hands into an awkward prayer pose. Dressed in black slacks and a plain white blouse, with a single braid falling behind her shoulder, she didn't turn her head to look at the spectators. Still, she felt the heat and rustle of people knotted into the courtroom of her murder trial. Could sense people's shoulders and heads waggling to catch a glimpse of her, to see her in handcuffs. A smell of sweat, old smoke and cheap perfume increased her nausea. Coughing noises ceased, but the hubbub rose as she, sat, as she neared her seat. All distant sounds to her, because mostly she heard the sickness of her own jagged breathing. She stared at the floorboards, highly polished heart pine, while the cuffs were removed and then sat heavy in the chair. It was 9.30am on February 25th, 1970. Tom leaned close to her and whispered what, that everything would be all right. She said nothing but searched his eyes for sincerity, anything to hang on. Not that she believed him, but for the first time ever, she had to put herself in the charge of another. Rather tall for 71 years, he wore his thick white hair and frumpy linen suits with the accidental, if cliched, grace of a country statesman. He moved gently and spoke quietly behind a pleasant smile that lived on his face. Judge Sims had appointed a young attorney for Miss Clark, since she had taken no action to do so herself. 
But when Tom Milton heard of this, he came out of retirement and requested to represent her pro bono. Like everyone else, he had heard stories about the Marsh Girl, and over the years had seen her occasionally, either drifting sleekly through the waterways as part of the current, or scurrying from grocery like from the grocery like a coon from a rubbish bin. When he first visited Kaya in jail two months ago, he'd been led into a small dark room, where she sat at a ta- where she sat at a table. She had not looked up at him. Tom had introduced himself, saying he would represent her, but she didn't speak or raise her eyes. He had an overpowering urge to reach out and pat her hand, but something, maybe her up- uptight posture or the way she stared vacant-eyed, shielded her from touch. Moving his head at different angles, trying to capture her eyes, he explained the court procedures, what she should expect, and then asked her some questions. But she never answered, never moved, and never looked at him. As they led her from room, from the room, she turned her head and glimpsed through a small window where she could see the sky. Seabirds shrieked over the town harbour, and Kaya seemed to be watching their songs. On his next visit, Tom reached into a brown paper bag and slid a glossy coffee table book toward her, titled The Rarest Shells of the World. It opened to life-sized oil paintings of shells from the most distant shores of the earth. Her mouth partly opened. She turned slowly through the pages, nodding at particular specimens. He gave her time. Then, once again he spoke to her, and this time she looked into his eyes. With easy patience, he explained the court procedures and even drew a picture of the courtroom, showing the jury box. The judge's bench, where the attorneys and she would sit. Then he added stick figures of the bailiff, the judge and the recorder and explained their roles. As on their first meeting... He tried to explain the evidence against her and to ask about her whereabouts on the night Chase died, but she pulled back into her shell at any mention of details. Later, when he stood to leave, she slid the book back across the table, but he said, No, I brought it for you. It's yours. She bit her lips and blinked. And now in the courtroom, for the first time, He tried to distract her from the bustle behind them by pointing out features of the courtroom in the drawing. But diversion was useless. By 9.45am, the gallery overflowed with villagers filling every pew and buzzed with high-pitched comments about the evidence, the death penalty. A small balcony at the rear seated 20 more, and though not marked, everybody understood coloured people were restricted to the balcony. Today it was filled with mostly, mostly with whites, but only a, f- a few blacks, this being a white case through and through. Sectioned off near the front sat a few journalists from the Atlanta Constitution and the Raleigh Herald, people who couldn't find seats bunched along the back wall and along the sides by the tall windows, fidgeting, muttering, gossiping. The Marsh Girl put up for murder. It didn't get any better than this. Sunday Justice, the courthouse cat, his back black, his face white with a black mask around green eyes, stretched out in a puddle of sunlight in one of the deep window sills. A courthouse fixture for years, he cleared the basement of rats and the courtroom of mice, earning his place. Because Barkley Cove was the first village settled in this torn and marshy stretch of the North Carolina coast, the Crown had declared it the county seat and built the original courthouse in 1754. Later, even though other towns such as Sea Oaks became more populated and developed, Barkley Cove remained the official hub for county government. Lightning struck the original courthouse in 1912, burning much of the wooden structure to the ashes. Rebuilt the next year on the same square at the end of Main Street, it was a brick two-storey with 12-foot windows trimmed in granite, By the 1960s, wild grasses and palmettos, and even a few cattails, had moved in from the marsh and taken over the once-groomed grounds. A lily-choked lagoon flooded in spring, and, over the years, had eaten part of the sidewalk. In contrast, the courtroom itself, 
designed to replicate the original, was imposing. The elevated judge's bench made of dark mahogany with a colourful inlay of the state seal stood under multiple flags, including the Confederate. The half wall of the jury box, also made of mahogany, was trimmed in red cedar and the windows that lined one side of the room framed the sea. As the officials entered the courtroom, Tom pointed to the stick figures in his drawing and explained who they were. That's the bailiff, Hank Jones, he said as a lanky man of sixty with a hairline that receded past his ears, making his head almost exactly half bald and half not, walked in the front of the room. He wore a grey uniform and a wide belt, hung with a radio, a flashlight, an impressive set of keys, and a holstered Colt six-shooter. Mr Jones called out to the crowd. Sorry, folks, but you all know the fire marshal's rules. If you don't have a seat, you got to leave. That's Miss Henrietta Jones, the bailiff's daughter, the court recorder, Tom explained as a young woman, as tall and thin as her father, walked in quietly and sat at a desk near the judge's bench. Already seated, the prosecuting attorney, Mr Eric Chastain, unpacked notepads from his briefcase. Eric, a broad-chested, red-haired man of nearly six feet, dressed in blue suits and wide, bright ties, purchased at Sears, Roebuck, in Asheville. Bailiff Jones called. All rise, this court is in session. The Honourable Judge Harold Sims presiding. Sudden silence fell. The chamber door opened and Judge Sims entered and no nodded for everyone to sit and asked both prosecuting and defence attorneys to approach the bench. A large boned man with a round face and bold white sideburns, he lived in Sea Oaks, but had officiated over Barclay Cove cases for nine years. He was generally considered to be a no-nonsense, level-headed and fair arbitrator. His voice boomed across the room. Mr Milton... Your motion to relocate this trial to another county on the grounds that Miss Clark cannot get a fair trial due to prejudices against her in this community is denied. I accept that she has lived in unusual circumstances and been subjected to some prejudice, but I see no evidence that she has endured more prejudices than many people on trial in small towns all across this nation, and some large towns for that matter. We will proceed here and now. Nods of approval eased through the room as the attorneys returned to their seats. He continued. Catherine Danielle Clark of Barclay, of Barclay County, North Carolina, you are charged with the murder in the first degree of Charles Lawrence Andrews, formerly of Barclay Cove. First degree murder is defined as premeditated act and, in such cases, the state is allowed to seek the death penalty. The prosecutor has announced that they will do so if you are found guilty. The room murmured. Tom seemed to have inched slightly closer to Kaya, and she didn't deny herself that comfort. We will begin the jury selection. Judge Sims turned toward the first two rows filled with potential jurors. As he read off the list of rules and conditions, Sunday Justice jumped from the window sill with a thud. And in one fluid motion leapt onto the judge's bench. Absent-mindedly, Judge Sims stroked the cat's head as, a con as he continued. In capital cases, the state of North Carolina allows a juror to be excused if he or she does not believe in the death penalty. Please raise your hand if you will not or cannot impose the death penalty if a guilty verdict is delivered. No hands were raised. Death penalty was all Kaya heard. The judge continued. Another legitimate reason to be excused from the jury is if you have now or had in the past such a close relationship with either Miss C with Miss Clark or Mr Andrews that you cannot object you cannot be objective in this case. Please let me know if you feel this is true. From the middle of the second row, Miss Sally Culpepper lifted her hand and stated her name. Her grey hair was pulled back severely in a tiny knot, and her hat, suit, and shoes bore the same dull brown. All right, Sally, tell me what's on your mind, the judge said. 
As you know, I was the truant officer for Barclay County for nearly 25 years. Miss Clark was one of my cases, and I had some dealings with her, or tried to. Kaya couldn't see Miss Culpepper or anyone in the main gallery unless she turned around, which of course she, she'd never do. But she remembered clearly the last time Mrs. Mrs. Culpepper sat in the car while the man in the fedora tried to chase her down. Kaya had been as easy on the old man as she could, taking off noisily through brambles to give him a clue, then circling back and hiding in some bushes next to the car. But Fedora ran in the opposite direction toward the beach. Crouching there, Kaya took a holly branch against the car door and Mrs Culpepper looked out the window directly into her eyes. She thought at the time that the truant lady smiled slightly. In any case, she made no attempt to give her away when the fedora returned, cussing up a streak, then driving down the road for good. Now Miss Culpepper said to the judge, Well, since I had dealings with her, I don't know if that means I should be excused. Judge Sims said, Thank you, Sally. Some of you may have dealt with Miss Clark in the shops or in official ways, as in Miss Culpepper's case, the truant officer. The point is... Can you listen to the testimony given here and decide whether she's guilty or innocent based on evidence, not on past experience or feelings? Yes, sir. I'm sure I can do that, Your Honour. Thank you, Sally. You can stay. By 11.30, seven women and five men sat in the jury box. From there, Kaya could see them and stole glances at their faces. Most of them she recognised from the village, though she knew few of the names. Mrs. Culpepper sat squarely in the middle and gave slight comfort to Kaya. But next to her sat Teresa White, blonde wife of the Methodist preacher, who years ago had rushed from the shoe shop to whisk her daughter away from Kaya as she stood on the curb after having lunch at the diner with Pa, the one and only time. Mrs. White, who had told her daughter that Kaya was dirty, now sat in the jury. Judge Sims called for a recess at around 1pm. The diner would bring over tuna fish, chicken salad and ham sandwiches for the jurors who would sit and eat in the de deliberation room. To be fair to the town's two eating establishments, the Dog Gone Beer Hall would deliver hot dogs, chilli and shrimp po'boys on alternative days. They always bought something for the cat too. Sunday Justice preferred po'boys. Chapter 39 Chase by Chance 1969 A fog was lifting from an August morning in 1969 as Kaya motored to a remote peninsula the locals called Cypress Cove, where she had once seen rare toadstools. August was late for mushrooms, but Cypress Cove was cool and moist, so perhaps she could find the rare species again. More than a month had passed since Tate had left the compass for her on the feather stump, and though she had seen him in the marsh, she hadn't ventured close enough to thank him for the gift. Neither had she used the compass, though it was tucked safely in one of the many pockets of her knapsack. Moss-draped trees hugged the bank, and their low-hanging limbs formed a cave or close to the shore through which she glided searching the thickets for small orange mushrooms on slender stalks. And finally she saw them, bold and brilliant, clinging to the sides of an old stump, and after beaching her boat, sat cross-legged in the cove, drawing them. Suddenly she heard footsteps, on the duff and then a voice. Well, look who's here, my marsh girl. Whirling around, standing at the same time, she stood face to face with Chase. Hello, Kaya, he said. She looked around. How had he gotten here? She'd heard no boat. He read her question. I was fishing, saw you pass, so landed over yonder on the other side. Please just go, she said, stuffing her pencils and pad in the knapsack. But he put his hand on her arm. Come on, Kaya. I'm sorry about how things turned out. He leaned in, wisps of breakfast bourbon on his breath. Don't touch me. Hey, I said I'm sorry. You knew, we, you knew we couldn't get married. You never could live near town. But I always cared about you. I stayed by you. 
stayed by me? What does that mean? Leave me alone. Kaya tucked the the knapsack under her arm and walked toward the boat, but he grabbed her arm, holding hard. Kaya, there'll never be anybody else like you, never, and I know you loved me. She ripped her arm from his hands. You're wrong. I'm not sure I ever loved you. But you talked to me about marriage, remember? You talked about building a house for you and me. Instead, I found out about your engagement to somebody else in the newspaper. Why'd you do that? Why, Chase? Oh, come on, Kaya. It was impossible. You must have known it wouldn't work. What's wrong with how things were? Let's go back to what we had. He reached for her shoulders and pulled her toward him. Let go of me, she twisted, tried to yank away, but he gripped her with both hands, hurting her arms. He put his mouth on hers and kissed her. She threw her arms up, knocking his hands away. She pulled her head back, hissing, Don't you dare. There's my lynx, wilder than ever. Grabbing her shoulders, he clipped the back of her knees with one of his legs and pushed her to the ground. Her head bounced hard on the dirt. I know you want me he said, leering. No, stop, she screamed. Kneeling, he jammed his knee to her stomach, knocking the breath from her as he unzipped his jeans and pulled them down. She reared up, pushing him with both hands. Suddenly, he slugged her face with his right fist. A sick popping sound rang in her head. Her neck snapped back and her body was thrown backward onto the ground, just like Pa hitting Ma. Her mind blanked for a few seconds against pounding pain. Then she twisted and turned, trying to squirm out from under him, but he was too strong. I'm not letting you go this time. Like it or not, you're mine. Finding strength from somewhere primal, she pushed against the ground from her knees and arms and reared up, at the same time swinging her elbow back against his jaw. As his head swung to the side, she struck him wildly with her fists until he lost balance and sprawled backward onto the dirt. Then, taking aim, she kicked him in his groin, square and solid. He bent double and rolled on his side, holding his testicles and writhing. For good measure, she kicked him in the back, knowing exactly where his kidneys lay, several times, hard. Pulling up her shorts, she grabbed the knapsack and ran to her boat, Snapping the starter rope, she looked back as he rose to his hands and knees, moaning. She cussed until the motor cranked, expecting him to chase after her any second. She turned the tiller sharply and accelerated away from the bank just as he stood. Her hand shaking, she zipped up her pants and held her body tight with one arm. Wild-eyed, she looked out to the sea and saw another fishing rig nearby, two men staring at her. Chapter 40, Cypress Cove, 1970 After lunch, Judge Sims asked the prosecutor, Eric, are you ready for you to call your first witness? We are, Your Honour. In former murder cases, Eric usually called the coroner first because his testimony introduced material evidence such as the murder weapon, time and place of death, and crime scene photographs, all of which made sharp impressions on the jurors. But in this case, there was no murder weapon, no fingerprints or footprints, so Eric intended to begin with motive. Your Honour, the people call Mr Rodney Horn. Everyone in court watched Rodney Horn step onto the witness stand and swear to tell the truth. Kaya recognised his face, even though she'd seen it for only a few seconds. She turned away. A retired mechanic, he was one of them, spending most of his days fishing, hunting or playing poker at the Swamp Guinea. Could his old liquor, could hold his liquor like a rain barrel. Today, as ever, he wore a denim bib overalls with a clear plaid shirt, starched so stiff the collar stood at attention. He held his fishing cap in the left hand as he swore in with the right, then sat down in the witness box, hat on his knee. Eric stepped casually to the witness stand. Good morning, Rodney. Morning, Eric. Now, Rodney, I believe you were fishing with a friend near Cypress Cove on the morning of August 30, 1969. Is that correct? It's exactly right. Me and Denny were at the fa- out there fishing, been there since dawn. For the record, that would be Denny Smith? Yep, me and Denny. 
All right. I would like you to tell the court what you saw that morning. Well, like I said, we'd been there since dawn, and it was near eleven, I reckon, and hadn't been a nibble for some time, so we was about to pull out our lines and heard out and head out when we heard a commotion in the trees over on the point in the woods. What kind of commotion? Well, uh, there was voices, kind of muffled at first, then louder. A man and a woman, and we couldn't see him, just heard them like they were fussing. Then what happened? Well, the woman started hollering, so we motored over to get a better look, see if she was in trouble. And what did you see? Well, by the time we got closer, we seen the woman was standing next to the man and, and kicking him right in the... Rodney looked at the judge. Judge Sims said, Where did she kick him? You can say it. Well, she kicked him right in the balls, and he slumped over on his side, moaning and groaning. Then she kicked him again and again in his back, mad as a mule chewing bumblebees. Did you recognise the woman? Is she in the courtroom today? Yeah, we knew her all right. It's that one there, the defendant, the one the folks call the Marsh Girl. Judge Sims leaned toward the witness. Mr Horn, the defendant's name is Miss Clark. Do not refer to her by any other name. All right, then. It was Miss Clark we seen. Eric continued. Did you recognise the man she was kicking? Well, we couldn't see him then because he was writhing and wiggling around on the ground. But a few minutes later he stood up and it was Chase Andrews, the quarterback a few years back. And then what happened? She came stumbling out towards her boat and, well, she was she was partway dressed, her shorts were around her ankles and um, her knickers were around her knees. Uh, she was trying to pull up her shorts and run at the same time and the whole time shouting at him. She went to her boat, jumped in and zoomed away and started and, and was still pulling up her pants. Well, she passed us by uh, and she looked at us right in the eyes. That's how I knew exactly who it was. You said she was shouting at, the, at him the entire time that she was running toward her boat. Did you hear exactly what she said? Yeah, we could hear her plain as day by then, because we were pretty close. Please tell the court what you heard her shout. She was screaming, Leave me alone, you bastard. You bother me again and I'll kill you. A loud murmur shot through the courtroom and didn't stop. Judge Sims banged his gavel. That's it. That'll do it. Eric said to his witness, That will be all. Thank you, Rodney. No further questions. Your witness. Tom brushed past Eric and stepped to the witness stand. Now, Rodney, you testified that at first, when you heard those muffled, loud but loud voices, you couldn't see what was going on between Mrs. Clark and Mr. Andrews. Is that correct? That's right. We couldn't see him till we moved up some. And you said the woman, who you later identified as Miss Clark, was hollering as if she was in trouble, correct? Yeah. You didn't see any kissing or sexual behaviour between the two consenting adults. You heard a woman shouting like she was being attacked, as if she was in trouble. Isn't that correct? Yeah. So isn't it possible that when Miss Clark kicked Mr Andrews, she was defending herself? A woman alone in the woods against a very strong athletic man? A former quarterback who attacked her? Well, yeah, I reckon that's possible. No further questions. Redirect? Yes, Your Honour, Eric said, standing up to the prosecution table. So, Rodney, no matter whether certain behaviour was consensual or not between the two of them, is it accurate to say that the defendant, Miss Clark, was extremely mad at the deceased, Chase Andrews? Oh, yeah, plenty mad. Mad enough to scream that if he bothered her again, she would kill him. Isn't that correct? Yeah, that's how it was. No further questions, Your Honour. Chapter 41 A Small Herd 1969 Kaya's hands fumbled at the tiller as she looked back to see if Chase was following in his boat from Cypress Cove. She motored fast to her lagoon and limp ran to the shack on swelling knees. In the kitchen, she dropped to the floor, crying, touching her swollen eye and spitting grit from her mouth. Then listened for sounds of him coming. 
She had seen the shell necklace. He still wore it. How could that be? You're mine, he'd said. He'd be mad as hell that she'd kicked him and he'd come for her. He might come that day, or wait for night. She couldn't tell everybody, anybody. Jumpin' would insist they call the sheriff, but the law would never believe the Marsh girl over Chase Andrews. She wasn't sure what the fish, two fishermen had seen, but they'd never defend her. They'd say she had it coming because, before Chase left her, she'd been smooching with him for years, behaving unladylike, acting the hoe, they'd say. Outside the window, the wind howled from the sea, and she worried that she'd never heard his, she'd never hear his motor coming. So moving slowly from the pain, she packed biscuits, cheese and nuts in her knapsack, head low against a manic gale, hurried through cord grass along channels toward the reading cabin. The walk took 45 minutes, and at every sound her sore and stiff body flinched, and her head jerked to the side, scanning the undergrowth. Finally, the old log structure, up to its knees in tall grass and clinging to the creek bank, whispered into view. Here the wind was calmer, the soft meadow quiet. She'd never told Chase about her hideout, but he might have known about it. She wasn't sure. The pack rat smell was gone. After the ecology lab hired Tate, he and Scupper fixed up the old cabin so he could stay overnight on some of his expeditions. They had shored up the walls, straightened the roof, and bought in and bought in basic furniture: a small quilt-covered bed, a cook stove, a table and chair. Pots and pans hung from the rafters. Then, out of place and plastic covered, a microscope sat on the folding table. In the corner, an old metal trunk stored tins of baked beans and sardines. Nothing to bring the bears in. But inside, she felt trapped, unable to see if Chase was coming, so she sat on the edge of the creek, searching the grassy waterland with her right eye. The left was swollen shut. Downstream, a herd of five female deer ignored her and wandered along the water's edge, nibbling leaves. If only she could join in. Belong to them. Kaya knew it wasn't so much that the herd would be incomplete without one of its deer, but that each deer would be incomplete without her herd. One lifted her head, dark eyes searching north into the trees, stomping her right front foot, and then left, and then the left. The others looked up, then whistled in alarm. Instantly, Kaya's good eye probed the forest for signs of chase or some other predator. But all was quiet. Perhaps the breeze had startled them. They stopped stomping but slowly moved away into the tall grass, leaving Kaya alone and uneasy. She scanned the meadow again for intruders, but the listening and searching sucked all her energy, so she went into the cabin, dug sweaty cheese from her bag, then slumped on the floor and ate mindlessly, touching her bruised cheek. Her face, arms and legs were cut and smeared with bloody grit. Knees scratched and throbbing, she sobbed, fighting shame, suddenly spitting uh, spitting the cheese out in a chunky wet spray. She'd bought this on herself, consorting unchaperoned. A natural wanting had led her unmarried to a cheap hotel, but still unsatisfied. Sex under flashing neon lights, marked only by blood smudged across the sheets like animal tracks. Chase had probably bragged about their doings to everyone. No wonder people shunned her. She was unfit. Disgusting. As the half-moon appeared between fast-moving clouds, she searched through the small window for man-like forms, hunched and sneaking. Finally, she crawled into Tate's bed and slept under his quilt, waking often, listening for footsteps, then pulling the soft fabric closely around her face. More crumbling cheese for breakfast, Her face darkened to green-purple now, eyes swollen like a boiled egg next stove up. Parts of her upper lip twisted grotesquely. Like Ma, monstrous, afraid to go home. In sudden clarity, Kaya saw what Ma had endured and why she left. Ma, she whispered, I finally, I finally see. Finally understand why you had to leave and never come back. I'm sorry I didn't know. 
that I couldn't help you. Kaya dropped her head and sobbed, then jerked her head up and said, I will never live like that, a life wondering when and where the next fist will fall. She hiked home that afternoon, but even though she was hungry and needed supplies, she didn't go to Jumpin's. Chase might see her there. Besides, she didn't want anyone, especially Jumpin, to see her battered face. After a simple meal of hard bread and smoked fish, she sat on the edge of her porch bed, staring through the screen. Just at that moment, she noticed a female praying mantis stalking along a branch near her face. The insect was plucking moths from her articulated forelegs, then chewing them up, their wings still flapping in her mouth. A male mantis, head high and proud as a pony, paraded along to court her. She appeared interested, her antennae flailing around like wands. His embrace might have been tight or tender. Kaya couldn't tell. But while he probed about with his copulatory organ to fertilise her eggs, the female turned back her long, elegant neck and bit his head off. He was so busy humping he didn't notice. His neck stump waved about as he continued his business and she nibbled on his thorax and then his wings. Finally, his last foreleg protruded from her mouth as his headless, heartless lower body copulated in perfect rhythm. Female fireflies draw in strange males with dishonest signals and eat them. Mantis females devour their own mates. Female insects, Kaya thought, know how to deal with their lovers. After a few days, she boated into the marsh, exploring areas Chase wouldn't know, but was jumpy and alert, making it difficult to paint. Her eye was still puffed around a thin slit, and the bruise had leached into its nauseated colours across half her face. Much of her body throbbed with pain. At the chirp of a chipmunk, she whirled around, listened keenly to the cause of crows, a language before words were, when communication was simple and clear, and whenever she, wherever she went, mapped an escape route in her mind. Chapter 42 A Cell 1970 Murky shafts of light streamed through a tiny window of Kaya's cell. She stared at dust motes, dancing silently in one direction as though following some dreamy leader. When they hit the shadows, they vanished. Without the sun, they were nothing. She pulled the wooden crate, her only table, under the window, which was about seven feet above the floor, dressed in a grey jumpsuit that said County Inmate printed on the back. She stood on the crate and stared at the sea, just visible beyond the thick glass and bars. White caps slapped and spat and pelicans, heads turn, turning for fish, flew low over the waves. If she stretched her neck far to the right, she could see the dense crown of the marsh's edge. Yesterday, she had seen an eagle dive and twist toward a fish. The county jail consisted of six 12 by 12 cells in a cement block, one story building behind the sheriff's office at the edge of town. The cells were in a row down the length of the building, only, one, only on one side so inmates couldn't see one another. Three of the walls were damp cement blocks, the fourth was made of bars, including the locked door. Each cell had a wooden bed with a bumpy cotton mattress, a feather pillow, sheets, one grey wool blanket, a sink, and a wooden crate table, plus a toilet. Over the sink was not a mirror, but a picture of Jesus, framed there by the ladies' Baptist auxiliary. The only allowance made for her, the first female in inmate, other than overnighters, in years, was a grey plastic curtain that could be pulled around the sink and toilet. For two months before the trial, she had been held in the cell without bail because of her failed attempt to escape the sheriff in her boat. Kaya wondered who started using the word cell instead of cage. There must have been a moment in time when humanity decided this shift. Self-scratched red webbing streaked her arms. For untracked minutes, sitting on her bed, she studied strands of her hair, plucking them like feathers, as gulls do. Standing on the crate... Craning her neck toward the marsh, she recalled an Amanda Hamilton poem. 
broken gull of Brandon Beach. Winged soul, you danced the skies, and startled dawn with shrilling cries. You followed sails and braved the sea, then caught the wind back to me. You broke your wing, it dragged the land, and etched your mark upon the sand. When feathers break, you cannot fly, but who decides the time to die? You disappeared, I know not where, but your wing marks still linger there. A broken heart cannot fly, but who decides the time to die? Even though inmates couldn't see one another, the only other occupants, two men at the far end of the row, spent much of each day and evening jabbering. Both were doing thirty days for starting a fight, which ended in a broken bar mirrors and a few bones, over who could spit the farthest at the dog-gone beer hall. Mostly they lay on their, set on their beds, calling to each other from their adjoining cells, sounding like drum squatters. Much of the banter was gossip they'd heard about Kaya's case from their visitors, especially her odds of getting the death penalty, which had not been issued in the county for twenty years, and never to a woman. Kaya heard every single word. Being dead didn't bother her, they couldn't scare her with threats of ending this shadow life. But the process of being killed by another's hands, planned out and set to schedule, was so unthinkable it stopped her breath. Sleep avoided her, slinking around the edges, then darting away. Her mind would plunge along deep walls of sudden slumber, and an, in and an instant of bliss, her body would shudder her awake. She stepped down from the crate and sat on the bed, Knees tucked to but under her chin. They'd brought her, they'd brought her here after court, so it might be six by now. Only one hour passed, or maybe not even that. <laughs>